Our scripture this morning comes from the Old Testament text, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. But I will be lifting up the focus verse for this sermon this morning. 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14 from the New Living Translation. And the focus verse reads as thus, But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of his Lord, his God, and he would heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farfar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. I expected him to wave his hands over the leprosy, call on the name of the Lord his God, and heal me. For the next few moments, I want to preach to you from the topic, it's not what you expect. It's not what you expect. In our text this morning, we encounter a man named Naaman. And Naaman, name means beautiful, pleasant, or well-formed. In other words, this was a man who was handsome, and his name reflected it. Contained within his name was this picture of a handsome man. And actually, Naaman was also a gifted military commander who actually was in service to one of Israel's surrounding nations called Syria. In the beginning of the text, it states that Naaman was a victorious man because the Lord was with him. Uh, and let me clarify this. Naaman was the military commander of Israel's enemy, Syria. And how many of you realize that sometimes those who oppose or come against you can be used by God? Calls us to question why certain people enter our lives and the purpose they serve, be it for good or for evil. And in understanding from the beginning is this, the hand of God was upon Naaman, so that all that had happened to him was because of God. Naaman suffered with leprosy, a skin disease which at the time had no cure. This person would become covered in bulging sores, weeping and oozing all over their body, including their face. Leprosy was considered a divine punishment and it was customary to remove lepers and isolate them in their own personal colony far removed from the rest of society. They lived in these colonies and became outcasts. They lived by themselves with absolutely no social interaction with the rest of the community. You can say in this current age with COVID-19, some of us have been living like lepers, away, limited social interaction. Once again, we see the hand of God in Naaman's life because he was given the chance to be healed of this incurable disease. I just want to stop here and make this point. Just because science and medicine labels a disease as incurable, God still has the ability even to heal diseases that man says has no cure. 
So enters a slave girl that God uses and this girl goes to Naaman and she lives and works in his household and she tells the wife of Naaman there is a prophet in Israel who can cure his leprosy. This person was the prophet Elisha. And upon hearing this, Naaman asked permission from the king to go and see the king of Israel. Now let's look at this. Naaman was told that a prophet in Israel, his enemy, could cure him, but the king of Aram sent Naaman to the king of Israel. In the letter he sends to the king of Israel, he states that he wants the king to cure Naaman of his disease. And Naaman takes silver and gold and expensive fabrics and clothing in order to buy his healing from the king. Now remember, the servant girl said, there is a prophet in Israel who can heal you. But when Naaman went to his king to get permission, his king said, uh-uh, I'm going to send you to the king and the king is going to be able to heal you. And it was expected that the king of Israel would know what to do. You see, I want to tell you that when I said it's not what you expect, my first point is expectation comes from what is normally done. Our expectations in life is usually defined by, by what we have become accustomed to doing or to seeing. Sometimes we expect only that which we know. Our expectations are shaped by our experiences. Our expectations are sometimes limited by what society tells us that we can and cannot do. If growing up you will only come to know one way of living, one way of being, then the expectation is that you too will just live or exist in that way. And how can our expectations ever change? Well, I'm going to answer that for you in a few minutes. I want to go back to the story. So now the king of Aram only dealt with the customs that one had to go to the king and the king would know what to do. Yes, out of respect and custom, one could not send his military commander into another territory with first, without first acknowledging the king and paying his respects and paying his respects with expensive gifts. The expectation was that this is how things were always done and that the king would know what to do even though the servant, the slave girl, already told him what he needed to do. He said, she said, you need to go to Elisha and Elisha would cure you. In this case, the usual expectation that the king, because of his status, could help Naaman was wrong. In actuality, the king thought it was a trick to start a fight between Israel and his country. If Naaman did what was expected, he first would have been isolated in a colony instead of seeking a cure. If Naaman did what was expected, he would have not listened to the advice of a slave girl. Expectations are changed by allowing God to rearrange what is expected. Expectations are changed by allowing God to show us another way, even if the way makes no sense. Expectations are changed when we humble ourselves and dare to receive advice and help from unlikely individuals. Somehow we are not told that Elisha hears about the king of Israel's response and he sends word to the king to send Naaman to his house. In those times, a prophet and a king had a very close relationship. The understanding was man could rule, but he needed godly wisdom, and that was the role of the prophet. The king was the ruler, but the prophet was the messenger and mouthpiece of God. 
Elisha's purpose was to show Naaman that Israel, God's chosen people, had prophets, and not just any prophets, but true prophets. Naaman goes to Elisha's house and Elisha sends his servant to tell Naaman, go to the Jordan River, wash yourself seven times, and after that, you would be healed and restored. Naaman, this military commander, goes to the house of Elisha, and Elisha does not even come to the door, but he sends his servant to give Naaman the instruction. Can you understand why Naaman became angry? Because this was not what he expected. He expected that when he showed up at Elisha's house, that Elisha himself would come to the door. He expected that when Elisha showed up and came to the door, that Elisha would look at him, call on the name of God. He expected Elisha to be the one to heal him. He expected that if Elisha wanted to send him to a river, expected to dictate and control his healing according to what he knew that prophets were supposed to do. Remember, only God's ordained prophets were true prophets. Elisha did not have to come to Naaman because Elisha wanted Naaman to know that when his healing came, it had nothing to do with him and everything to do with his God. Naaman was used to the antics of false prophets in the land. His expectations were based on what he knew and what he was familiar with. But how many of you know this? God works in ways not to meet our expectations, but for us to meet his. It's not about what we expect, but it's about what God expects. In this story, God had to get the glory, not Elisha. If Elisha had done what Naaman expected and come and waved his hand and called on the name of God, Elisha would have gotten the credit for Naaman's healing. But God, through Elisha, had to show Naaman that his healing could be spoken. God, through Elisha, had to show Naaman that the power of God does not need man-made tactics and man-made tricks. God had to show Naaman that his healing was not going to be natural, but supernatural. Some of you have the expectation that our president number 45 should heal the land of this disease and you have no idea and some of you are frustrated. Why is he not doing anything? Because that's what you expect. But maybe God doesn't want him to do anything. So when the healing in the land comes, we who know the name of God have no other choice but to say, it is God who healed us. It is God who restored us. It is God who drove this disease from the land. In our lives, for expectations to change, we have to allow God to come in and do the unexpected. In our lives, for expectations, to change. We have to give up some of our usual ways of thinking and understanding how things should be or should work in our lives. For expectations to change, we have to allow God to direct the path. In our lives, for expectations to change, we have to allow God to show us different ways of being, thinking, and acting. If we continue to do what is only expected based on what we see and what we know, our expectations will never change. We have to yield, surrender, and submit what we expect to allow God to change our expectations. There was a time that I listened to the Olympics and I listened as they highlighted stories of athletes and it, it dawned on me that most of them based on their gender and race and economic status and living standards and health challenges and societal limitations and stereotypes would have never become great Olympians. Those of faith, regardless of the God they believed in, overcame all obstacles 
because they dared to expect more. They dared to expect something different that God was going to do with their lives. They expected that God would elevate them from their circumstances and they expected that God would give them the strength, determination and commitment to train and endure and make it to the Olympics and they also expected that God would give them a medal. As a sinful and disobedient people, we could not have expected God to come down, clothe himself with flesh, walk and talk among us as, as Jesus the Son. As a sinful and, and disobedient people, we could not have expected Jesus to heal the sick and raise the dead. As a sinful and disobedient people, we could not have expected Jesus to die for our sins on an old rugged cross. As a sinful and disobedient people, we could not have expected Christ himself to raise himself from the dead. Imagine what God can do. Imagine what we can expect if we are righteous and obedient. It's not about what we expect. It's about what God expects us to do. It's not about us expecting things to be the same way we want them to be. But it's about us seeing this from a different lens, from the God lens. For us to stop looking at the natural and be discouraged. For us to look at the supernatural and be encouraged. Naaman finally went to the Jordan River. He finally went in and dipped himself seven times. And do you know what happened? He was healed and restored. So I'm here to tell you today, saints, everything that is going on in the land, it's not about what you expect. It's about what God expects of us. It's not about what you expect. You're waiting for mankind to step in. And I don't have anything about the political race coming up. And I don't have have anything against Biden or Harris uh, but if you're waiting here with the expectation uh, that on November 3rd things are going to miraculously change uh, well it's not what about you expect uh, what you should expect that if you humble yourself uh, if you call on the name of God uh, if you turn from your wicked ways uh, if you petition God long enough uh, the expectation in the Bible says uh, that God himself will come uh, and heal the land it's not going to be dependent on an election. It's not going to be dependent on the CDC. But it's going to be dependent when God lifts his hand off of us. It's going to be dependent when we cry, have mercy, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. It's going to depend on us getting into the word like we've never gotten into the word. It's going to depend on us to bring help and voice to the voiceless. It's going to depend on us to do things in incredible in this season things that other people wouldn't imagine to do it's going to depend on us to reach a helping hand when the people said that we should stay away one from the other it's going to be the expectation that when you get out of your doors when you come into the streets even during a pandemic I am proud of people who come out and protest I am proud of people who come out and shout for justice because the expectation is God is going to do something different. So it's not about what you expect. So my brothers and my sisters and my sisters and my brothers this morning, I want to say to you, change your expectations. Don't expect anything from yourself. Don't expect anything from others around you. But look to the hills from which come at your help because the expectation is that your help is going to come from the Lord. Go into the secret shelter of the God Almighty because the expectation is that when you seek him like you've never sought him before that he's going to move like you've never seen him move before. He told the prophet Isaiah I'm going to do things in a new way and I need you to perceive it. So brothers and sisters in this season in order for your expectations to change you got to realize that God doesn't expect anything from you. Our expectation is from him. Great expectation only comes by depending on a great God. 
I hope that this sermon blessed you this morning. I hope that you realize that the Savior we're looking for will not be found in the voting booth. But the Savior we're looking for is a Savior that we already know. And his name is Jesus. No one expected him to show up on the scene. No one expected him to challenge the status quo. No one expected him to die. And no one expected him to rise again. But what he did tell us is to expect that he's coming again. That is the only expectation we can trust and are guaranteed of. And I'm here this morning to extend to some of you, those under the sound of this message, if you expect God to change things in your life, you gotta first know the God who you can expect things from. His name is Jesus. And all you have to do this morning is declare that he is the Lord of your life. The only expectation you have or need is that he will forgive your sins. And the only expectation that he expects from you is that you will believe that his father in heaven rose him from the dead. And the greatest expectation given to you in this moment is that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, the expectation, promise, and guarantee is that you shall be saved. If there's anyone who received salvation this morning and you would like to reach out to our ministry to touch base with myself as the pastor or another minister at the church, you can email us at cfamec at gmail.com c-f-a-m-e-c at gmail.com may God bless you this morning and I may not know your name but if you prayed that prayer of salvation I welcome you as God has written your name in the Lamb's book of life amen